Welcome to the open lecture, Physical Activity, Public Health and the Energy Crisis. My name is Peter Schantz and um, I'm leading the research group for Movement, Health and Environment at UH in Stockholm, Sweden. Within it, we study relations between those issues and in this presentation, both negative and positive examples will be illuminated. We also elaborate on how to solve the complex of physical activity in public health, as well as at the same time support sustainable development. One of the relevant issues is to what extent increased physical activity can mitigate the energy crisis. But before we move into those issues, let me show you the setting where I work. Here it is in spring. In the circle in the center is placed a sculpture. It's called Homage to Per Henrik Ling and honors the founder of GIH. I've always enjoyed passing it. For me, it represents a sense of hope for the future. And today there's a great need for that. I've created a, mini a number of mini lectures to cover this, the broad subject of this open lecture. The disposition is, first of all, a tribute to a teacher. Hope for the future is supported by good examples. Let me therefore present and pay a tribute to a legendary teacher in exercise physiology, Professor Per Olof Åstern, whom this year would have been 100 years old. Here we see his thesis and textbook of work physiology a Bible in the field. Now, if you look in the right lower right corner, the fitted there signals the references which will be stated at the end. The first chapter in textbook is entitled Our Biological Heritage. And when he taught it at GIH, he always converted the 4.6 billion years that Earth and our solar system has existed into the distance between two major cities in Sweden, Gothenburg and Stockholm. Distance between them is 460 kilometers or 285 miles. After about 90 kilometers, photosynthetic capacity to capture energy from the solar system started to exist. After about 300 kilometers, the cyclic ATP ADP system for energy storage and delivery started to exist. It is that system that delivers energy to the interaction between filaments in the heart and the skeletal muscle that lead to a shortening of the distance between the said lines. Thereby, a force, muscle force is developed and enable life and to move. When he came to the center of Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, he started to explain what has happened the last four million years. And as the good teacher he was, he made it concrete through using the 400 meter tra running track in the nearby Olympic Stadium from 1912. The images will now speak for themselves. Ostrand hoped that the biological history should create perspectives and perhaps also humility, reverence and actions. Think of that. You are the result of 3.8 billion years of evolutionary success. Act like it. His interest in these perspectives led him to visit and study the Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert. He followed them during their often daily hunting trips of about 15 to 30 kilometers. They never ran, except for sometimes when coming close to the prey. Why only walking? The answer was to save energy. He stated their overall energy demands per individual for 24 hours and compared it with the Western world in the 1980s. Wolstan had, together with his wife Irma, developed an ergometer cycle test for estimating the maximum oxygen uptake. 
and he could in that way get a measure of the maximum aerobic capacity of the hunters. Energy for survival demanded physical activity. Both during mankind's long hunting and gathering period and during the manual farming era. Perspectives on energy crisis and systems. It is today more than urgent to tackle many different aspects related to energy crisis. The CO2 emissions and climate crisis are obvious. Now, messages like this are relevant and there will be immediate contributions, but we have reasons to wonder to what extent can it help. Many of today's energy issues are coupled to matters of security. The dependence on fossil fuels has led to weaknesses in terms of national independence that can be used for blackmail and to fuel aggressive wars, with atrocities in Ukraine being an ongoing and tragic example. Again, messages like this are relevant. Other security issues are related to nuclear energy as such, but also in relation to what hostile nations and terror groups are capable of in our times. The energy crises are, however, even wider. While we need a reduction and alteration in type of energy usage on one level, at the same time, human movement-induced energy usage is important for various health aspects. This scheme simplifies sources related to different technical energy solutions. All of them create electricity directly or indirectly. So the fact that we use electricity is by no means non problematic non-problematic as such, since it, since it can originate from fossil fuels. Today, it is finally mainstream to advocate for the uses of more renewable and less fossil fuels. However, we need all the systems possible in the precarious situation mankind is in. We have therefore very good reasons to add the possible contributions from the biological energy systems with solar system, photosynthesis, and consecutive biological oxidations. And to let the green energy sources assist each other. Let us remind ourselves of the photosynthesis in the plants, fueled by solar energy, creating oxygen and carbohydrates that are converted in our bodies into the energy currency that is used in biological systems, namely ATP. As stated before, these systems have been developed during billions of years, and they are very efficient, clean, strong, adaptable, and necessary for sustaining our life and health. Now to the adaptive capacity in biological, energetic, and muscular systems. Exercise physiology is a fascinating knowledge field about this important energy system. Let me show some examples from the textbook by Austin and Rudolf. With increasing physical work, we see an increase in oxygen uptake until at one point where it does not increase anymore. Then we reach the maximum oxygen uptake in his thesis, Austin developed techniques for measuring these matters. For exercise and training, he also showed that we can increase the maximum level of oxygen uptake. Here we see another image of that, the maximum oxygen uptake can increase with training. But more important is that we can make use of this capacity to a much greater extent during prolonged exercise. Thus, the utilizable aerobic processes can in principle be increased with about 
the advertisements in this respect are not least taking place in the heart, but they are not limited to that. Let me show some other examples of adaptive capacity. To the left, we see cross-section of skeletal muscle with the cell boundaries and dots representing capillaries, the very small blood vessels from which oxygen and nutrients flow into the cells. With exercise, in this case, slow skiing, the number of capillaries can increase up to 50%. But if one then stops the exercise, then we lose the capillaries. Here's another example. We have studied how six weeks of exercise training on an ergometer cycle can affect the capacity to produce ATP in the cell's energy plants, the mitochondrion. Given that production energy can move to the muscle's contractile filaments, then the muscle contraction can take place and generate muscle force. As you see here, with that training, the capacity increased with 50 to 90% depending on the fuel used. And the one increasing 90% is the most important fuel. So there is an enormous adaptive capacity. But if you stop to be physically active, then it degrades itself. Another example relates to the fact that we all have different forms of muscle fiber types. But with exercise, they can transform from super fast to slow muscle cells, which will lead to a greater endurance and much higher energy efficiency. We used to view skeletal muscle as an important organ that made it possible to move around. But today we know that it is also an endocrine organ communicating with many other organs a fantastic window to a new world of understanding has thereby been opened. At your age, we're very proud of that the former PhD student and professor, Dr. Beng Satin, was one of the pioneers in this research line. He had Paolo Austin as tutor, and here we see them executing the Austin ergometer cycle test at our lab. Now on us to physical aspects on physical activity and health. We now know that the physical activity can prevent several diseases, and this is, these are just some few examples. Our understanding of those relations refers to the exercise intensities used as expressed by oxygen uptake and energy expenditures, both in quantitative and qualitative terms. The WHO recommends the following levels of physical activity to prevent diseases and premature mortality. Adults aged 18 to 64 should do at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity. Moderate intensity is defined in relation to the maximum oxygen uptake, again a measure that Austin developed. Now, we have illuminated both transport walking and cycling with valid measurement instruments and noted that they fulfill the criteria for health enhancing physical activity. Here we see an example of decreased risk for premature mortality for all causes with increased energy consumption in leisure time physical activity per week. The decreases seem to level out after a reduction of 40%. And we have recently coupled a public health recommendation of 6,000 transport steps a day, five days a week, corresponding to those levels. With all my experience in the field of physical activity and public health in support of sustainable development and the current global population levels, as well as the energy crisis, I have more and more been thinking in terms of a physical activity pyramid with the most important and realistic forms at the bottom. And there I place walking, cycling, and e-cycling of moderate intensities. Now, 
to the secular development in physical activity. Let us move back to the time axis. During all millenniums before the 1950s, we have moved ourselves around substantially, substantially. And that was also valid during the beginning of the industrialization period. Here are images from the Netherlands and Stockholm in the first half of the 20th century. Then came the cars. In the beginning, parents felt safe letting their children cycle among the few cars. But soon the number of cars and speeds came an increasing hindrance for both cycling and walking. A long period of drainage of physical activity thereby had started. In our times, we have studied the perceptions of pedestrians in the inner urban area of Stockholm in relation to the four variables for motorized traffic. We note that the perceptions indicate that uh, speed uh, stimulates flow and combine the lead to uh, noise levels, and that these levels, these variables, hinder walking and create a sense of unsafety due to traffic. Now, this is counterproductive for the willingness to walk and for the environmental well-being while walking. The same apply for cycling, which we have studied in previous earlier studies. So here we see an example of effects related to movement of the environment. Traffic stands for direct negative effects on health by exhaust fumes, particular matters, and noise. It also hinders physical activity and thereby indirectly health. It's therefore not surprising that with an increasing number of cars, a new category of diseases appeared, the so-called welfare diseases. And that the aerobic power is lowered within the population. Obesity epidemics facilitated. And finally, motorized traffic adds substantially to the climate crisis. So, what to do? Is the old theme, energy for survival, capital physical activity, still valid. To what extent can, for example, the distances in everyday life be used for physical activity? So let us move on to distance potentials and I will take the example of cycling. In a gradient from rural areas to the center of a metropolitan area, Obviously, there is a great variability in those distances to, for example, work, shops, relatives, and friends. This is such an area, the county of Stockholm, with about 2 million inhabitants. We were three researchers with very different backgrounds that asked ourselves how many of those that, take the, that today take the car to work should instead be able to cycle the same distance using a maximum of 30 minutes. Through combining data from several databases, we could establish that more than 350,000 persons drove cars to work and about 53,000 individuals cycled. Again, how many of the car drivers could cycle to work on a maximum of 30 minutes? Well, that depends on how fast car drivers can cycle. In order to calculate that, we had data from commuter cyclists and could, via, via some steps, compare them with population data based on the Austin ergometer test, by the way, and thereby create formulas for the likely speeds in the population given age and sex. Given that, we calculated that out of the 352,000 car travels, about 111,000 car trips could be cycled within 30 minutes. 
Their average distance was 3.4 kilometers, speed 14 kilometers, and duration 14.5 minutes. With uh, such a changeover, the numbers would become these. Now, we ask ourselves to what extent can such a changeover mitigate air pollution and carbon dioxide emissions? For studying that, we combine an other analytic tools and could thereby calculate the betterment of the air that everyone in the region breathe, and here we see the results. Thereafter, we calculate the health benefits within the whole population in the county. In a population of more than 2 million people, one could save 63 lives annually and gain 449 years of remaining lives every year. Thus, we see here an example of how cycle not only increase the physical activity, but also have positive effects on, for example, the air quality and noise, which benefits with benefits for all living in the region. Now here we see the three initiating researchers and one of our studies, Christy Johansson and Bertil Forsberg are professors at the universities of Stockholm and Umeå, respectively. Now for this lecture, I have calculated the same liters of petrol for one, from one single trip of maximum 30 minutes of cycling. And it amounts to about 22,000 liters, and the amount of carbon dioxide that is not emitted to the atmosphere amounts to about 63,000 kilo. Thus, we have shown in con a concrete and realistic example of the possibilities coupled to increased cycling. So here we see how cycling can have can, can have a direct and positive effect on health, but also lead to betterment in the air we breathe and thereby have another positive effect on health via the environment. Likewise, reduced carbon dioxide emissions will have that positive effect. This leads us to asking ourselves, what is the potential for e-bikes and public transit in these respects? Given the findings stated above, it is very important to know what the distance potential of e-cycling is during 30 minutes. Now, uh, here we see some examples of uh, uh, different types of e-bikes. Our calculations of transport cycling speeds in the Swedish population of today are the following. Now, in Europe, the electrically assisted um, bicycles can reach a maximum speed of 25 kilometers per hour. We don't know how much of this speed potential that is used, but we are now aiming to study that. Now, here we see the individual's potential with different age to via aerobic muscle power create cycling speeds. This image signals the potential of increased speeds when the aerobic muscle power is combined with electrical power from the e-bike. And how this can translate into cycling speeds. Now it's also important to ask ourselves, what is the potential of combinatory travels in this respect? Let us again take a realistic example from Stockholm and know that when ordinary adults living in suburbs of Greater Stockholm were asked what could make them cycle or cycle more to work or school, then almost 30% stated, if I could take the bicycle with me on the public transit. Now to an example. A person lives and works at these spots. The cycling distance is considered to be too long. 
he or she drives a car, but would prefer not doing that. Instead, a dream is to be able to make use of a public transit train that already exists and to cycle to the station, ride with the train, and then cycle the other path to reach the workplace. Now, here we see an example from a train in Switzerland with this kind of option for combinatory travel. But more such options need to be fixed. Here we see, for example, subway. <clears throat> now, this image is either straying in normality, but with technical development, new possibilities can rather easily become real. There is an enormous potential to advance the societies in this respect and thereby increase physical activity, cut energy usage, and cut carbon di dioxide emissions. Now, very shortly, some perspectives on e-cars. Are they a solution? Well, let me be clear that e-cars are not the solution to several environmental problems associated with massive automobile societies. They lead to the same noise levels as normal cars from the speed of 30 kilometers per hour and onward. And they lead to non-healthy particles in the air, furthermore they create congestion, etc. If they are produced, which is a very energy demanding process, then it's important that they are used very much. So for example, electric taxis, buses and lorries are reasonable usage areas, but, and this is an important but, this is only relevant if the electricity used in the production and when the car or other electric vehicles are driven, that that electricity is green. Note at the same time, the dilemma that the batteries need very scarce minerals and plans for new mines already creates conflicts. For example, the other day, the news described the conflict up north in Sweden between a mining company and the Sami people that has lived there for thousands of years. Furthermore, e-cars are very heavy due to the batteries that weigh 500 kilos. This means that they will demand very much electricity, which will increase the costs of it. A weight comparison with e-bikes is from these perspectives of value. I think we have good reasons to ask ourselves, is it reasonable with uh, 2000 kilo cars moving around one person and standing still 95% of the time? To me, there must be very, very much smarter solutions, and that leaves a great space for new innovations. Now onward to a summary. In this open lecture, realistic examples of using more biologically created energy through physical activity, and thereby reducing usage of fossil fuels and carbon dioxide mm -hmm. emissions such examples has, have been uh, presented. This shows the potential to mitigate the energy crisis and create a better health within the whole population. And it deserves to be explored in more detail and at more settings. Furthermore, solutions with e-bikes and combinatory travels are a great interest in these contexts. So whereas there are several ways of transporting ourselves, My suggestions are framed in green. This, this enables diminishing the multiple negative environmental effects of car traffic. If instead cycling is increased, there is not only a potential to, po to, to substantial positive health and climate effects, but it can also lead to an initiation of a benign circle in which more recycling and less cars lead to better route environments 
that can stimulate even to more cycling and so it can move on. Returning to the statue. My message is, it is time for optimism and creativity. More green innovations are needed. The energy crisis can be mitigated and hopefully also solved. Use your own amazing green, adaptive and energy efficient movement power. Use public transit and trains. And please act. Now here comes the um, list of references. And many of them are freely downloadable at ResearchGate. You see the name of that site down in the bottom. Now, if you understand uh, Swedish, then I can recommend these two reports from the National Traffic Authority in Sweden as a follow-up of this lecture. They can also be downloaded, downloaded at ResearchGate. And finally, I hope that you have enjoyed the lecture, learned something, and thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you want to pose any question to me, uh, please make use of the email address below. And again, thank you and goodbye.